Welcome everyone to the MongoDB podcast live. I'm Jesse Hall, a senior developer advocate here at MongoDB, and we have some really cool topics to discuss today. We're going to talk about AI, vector embeddings, vector search, RAG. By the end of this, you're going to have a much better understanding of what all of that actually is. Uh, so let us, let us know in the comments, uh, what is your experience with AI in general? What are your thoughts? We'd love to hear from you. Um, and this is actually part of a series uh, surrounding AI and vector search. Last week, we had some amazing announcements at Dot Local London, including vector search updates. We also uh, premiered this video explaining uh, what vector what vectors are. Um, we also had a live stream from uh, Shane and Mira talking about vector search and Google Cloud. We have our stream today, another video premiering tomorrow, a stream on Thursday talking about vector search in AWS. Uh, another stream next week uh, with Henry Weller and, um, oh, sorry, that's my cat. Um, my cat actually loves vector search and AI as well. But so stay tuned for all of the upcoming content. And without further ado, today we have a special guest, Prakul Agarwal. Let's bring you on the stage. Welcome, Prakul. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Jesse. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, maybe to get us started, maybe you could share just a little bit about your background uh, with our audience. What got you into machine learning? Yeah, so so currently I'm a senior product manager at Pongarimi focused on machine learning and AI. Um, and I always have had that uh, passion, right? Like starting from the undergrad, like I've always had those courses taken in and I had some of those projects going on and machine learning was becoming the hot new thing. Um, so mm -hmm. I think what really deepened the interest was essentially building my own startup, which failed, uh, where we really wanted to scratch this itch of ours, which was how do you play the right music at the right time, mm -hmm. right? So we had phones, which knew so much about us and music generally spotify soundcloud knew what kind of music i liked but there was a lot of variability when i it was a monday morning versus wednesday evening if i'm sitting in the school versus if i'm on like a office versus if i'm in my gym like i have a lot of preference that mm. changes dramatically so i want to it to change change adapt to it like you know without me having to figure out what i liked mm -hmm. so to figure that mystery out is we used uh, ai to understand the sensor data to understand activity and how that correlates to your uh, like music listening habits and that's something that really deepened the mm -hmm. that's really neat i mean there, there's so many applications and uh and coming up with with the different use cases it's amazing uh, to see what people come up with um, also, a quick reminder to the audience, I see some questions already. Yes, this is going to be recorded. You'll be able to uh, watch this after the fact if you're not able to keep uh, watching live. Uh, so don't worry about that. You, it will be available. Um, one last thing I like to do before we kind of get started is do something I call the developer icebreaker. And I want the audience to participate too. So basically what it is, is I didn't prepare you for this ahead of time. I'm sorry, but it's okay. Uh, I ask really quick questions and you just answer the first thing that comes to the top of your mind. I promise nothing controversial or anything. So audience get ready to answer too. So for cool, Android or iPhone? iPhone. Okay, let's see. What's the audience saying? Oh, awesome. I, I forgot there's like a 30 second delay. So they're probably not gonna answer that quickly. <laughs> um, okay, Windows, Mac or Linux? Uh, Mac. Okay, well, I go, I go back and forth between Windows and Mac. So um, this, this is the question that is like a deal breaker for a lot of people, whether we can be friends or not. <laughs> what is your favorite code editor or IDE? I really like uh, V. <laughs> uh, that was okay. my favorite for the longest time, but yeah, VS Code more recently. <laughs> VS Code, yeah, well, yeah, okay. So uh, yeah, I see a bunch of answers coming in now. iPhone, Android, Mac. Uh, Linux, Linux, okay, so some, that's good. Um, all right, all right, uh, tabs or spaces? Um, spaces. Spaces, really, okay. I generally just go with whatever Prettier says, um, but if I had to pick one, I would say tabs. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, last question, coffee or tea? Uh, coffee. Coffee, okay, good, me too. 
Awesome. All right, let's 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 get into the actual content now. So we're going to talk about uh, AI, vector search, RAG architecture. Um, let me go ahead. Uh, let me know when you're ready to share your screen, and we'll get into the slides. Um, we have some slides to go over, and then um, we can answer ask some questions. Audience as well, if you have some questions that you want to uh, us to answer, ask them in the comments as well. Um, is your screen ready to share? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it looks like you're looking at, oh, there you go. There we go. Awesome. All right, I'll let you go ahead and take it away. Cool. Yeah, so yeah, I think we were gonna be talking about a lot of AI ML, so I wanted to do this kind of a level set and start with the very basics of generative AI, right? I think at this point, unless you have been living under a rock, you mm -hmm. have heard of a lot of large language models and you've heard about like probably all the trying to figure out how to use it for your business, for your personal stuff. So what exactly is it, right? So mm -hmm. um, for me, like, you know, I think large language models and like, you know, I just want to break this down into these two broad concepts, right, that we would be using. So one is your standard large language models. So these are your generative models, uh, also called as autoregressors, which would basically be able to generate the next token given a prior information string. Um, example of this is obviously like ChatGPT, right? And the underlying model that powers it, like a GPT 3.5, GPT 3, GPT 4. So on the bottom left, we see write a poem about AI event and it would bust out that poem for you. So that large language model really is something that's been trained over vast amounts of data. In this case, everything that was available on internet. And it is really like a very broad general purpose model, mm -hmm. right? So we talked about its ability to generate text given like a command. But on the right, bottom right, we also see another large language model. Um, a foundational model DALI2 mm -hmm. from OpenAI, mm -hmm. which given like a text prompt is able to create a picture, like an image. So on the bottom right, we see given a prompt, a man standing on top of a building overlooking a futuristic city, 2D game art background. Mm -hmm. And that's how you came, came up with that kind of an image that we see there. Yeah. So, so like, you know, these are, these are your like, you know, large number. other popular large language models are like, uh, Meta's Llama model, uh, open AI's GPT-4 we talked about, as well as Google's Palm 2. The, the second one, second important one, is this thing called uh, like the embedding models, or mm -hmm. what we get from them, which is your vector embeddings, right? So this is something which we would be focusing on a lot. But very simply put, um, like, you know, so embeddings are kind of these Embedding models are something called autoencoders, which basically given like an input, uh, convert that input into a representation, an internal representation that is understood by these essentially large neural networks. So like, you know, very at the very core, uh, vectors are your numeric representation of data and related context, right? So this data could be text, code, images, sound, videos, and, Given an embedding model, it will convert that into like a vector or like a list of floating point numbers, right? Yeah. So this list would have like a dimension, like number of elements that are there, which are really dependent on the embedding model. And mm -hmm. just for like, you know, just a deeper dive, embedding models and these like, you know, generational large language models, the way they're related is basically embedding is the top layer, the second last layer of these models so you that that's where like you know you're getting the representation of all the different uh, parameters or the nodes in that neural network in that last layer so yeah. but for our context like um, this the ability to be able to take this unstructured data like a uh, sound video audio text and convert it into like a fixed point floating point array uh, like you know what it lets us do is convert that into an value like that can be handled by databases right mm -hmm. and that's where we would be using it for building a lot of amazing applications yes so, so taking us just a really quick step back from this what to to explain to the audience like what 
is the use of an embedding? Like, why do we need embeddings? Yeah, yeah. So that's an excellent question. Um, so now with embeddings, we have the power of these large language models, right? That's been that can understand essentially everything that exists on the internet that's been trained on it. Mm -hmm. So and now we can use it for converting our information. So suppose mm -hmm. we have uh you have like let's say some information within your business like that's not available online so mm -hmm. you can understand it semantically you can actually search for a query in natural language like okay give me my what is the salary of a certain employee right so that kind of a query can really be applied uh on your own data so mm -hmm. that's what the vector embeddings allow you to do that's it that's exactly. an example exactly yeah your ability to to basically train well have the ai model the ml model um search and and query based on the your own personal data uh, that's that's yeah, what the embeddings are for yeah okay and it also opens up a bunch of other cool use cases anomaly detection retrievals recommendation mm -hmm. system um and yeah so and i think the big power with these foundational embedding models is like you know you just take it off the shelf and you can start using it mm -hmm. and you would get pretty far ahead before wanting to build your own or fine tune your own model yeah. and we'll talk about it later so what are vectors yeah you... and yeah vectors or your embeddings really mm -hmm. are interchangeably being used here mm -hmm. right um, vector at a very core is this like array of floating point numbers right this is your array mm -hmm. uh, this which we'll call the vector or like an embedding or a vector embedding uh, in this case other pieces so this um like you know one of the reasons for vector is basically this represents a point in you can think about it like a, if it's an n-dimensional space mm -hmm. right this would represent like a point so in this case let this thing that n-dimensional is like two-dimensional like a, a plane and mm -hmm. Given that like two dimensional embedding model, right? Like you would take a dog and it would basically become this point right here. Mm -hmm. uh, given a cat, it will become a point which lands here. The kitten given a point will become here. So mm -hmm. essentially a vector has a magnitude and like, you know, there is a angle between two magnitude, like two vectors. Yeah. So now given this kind of a representation, we can see that cat and kitten are closer together. So it essentially is acting as this measure of similarity. Mm -hmm. Something like a dog is farther apart from cat or kitten and is further farther apart from something like a house. Mm -hmm. So uh, with this kind of a thing, like, you know, we can imagine um, how we could do some of the similarity. Um, but like, it's important to remember, like, you know, it's n-dimensional and it has like an angle, it has a magnitude. And we mm -hmm. can do our vector math on it to figure out how close or farther apart uh, a given vector is. So, yeah, with I'm, this, I'm, if you're trying to do, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm just gonna say like, you know, if you're gonna do code similarity search, right? I am, I have this snippet. I want to see what other code is similar mm -hmm. to it. Like, you know, that's mm -hmm. exactly the concept we'll use that you, you're using for cat and kitten. Exactly. And I'm, I'm a very visual person, so this, um, this slide works very well for me because you just show me a bunch of numbers. I have no idea what that is, but I see that you're, you're basically graphing this out in this in dimensional, this is two, two dimensional in this case, but it could be multiple, multiple dimensional space. And you're trying to figure out where these vectors, um, land in this space and, and the closer ones obviously are related. And so this, this makes total sense to me. Any questions so far from the audience, just let us know, put it in the chat. I don't see any questions right now though. So, <laughs> um, so let me see what, um, so what is this next slide about? Yeah. So now we understand, like, you know, we have all seen chat GPT. Um, I now really talk, want to talk about what kind of a problem is there, right? Like if you, mm -hmm. if as developers, we want to build applications, like, you know, we have seen how powerful chat GPT and some of these other language models could be, but where exactly is the challenge? So. I'm going to talk about this one example where we ask chat GPT this question, which is how much better is GPT-4 mm -hmm. in reducing hallucinations over GPT-3.5? 
So that's a lot of words, not mm -hmm. important. It just, this page is what I want to show of where the problem is. So mm -hmm. the response you will literally get is GPT is saying that, okay, I don't know what this means. And my knowledge was cut off in September, 2021. Yeah. And more interestingly, going on to make a whole bunch of things that it doesn't know, but it's mm -hmm. very convincing. It's saying, uh, like, you know, it's talking about hallucinations. It's talking about mental conditions like schizophrenia. It's talking about medical professionals. So it's all very coherent, all very sensible. And this page right here, this query right here represents a bunch of problems that mm -hmm. exist with these large language models, right? So the question that I asked, right? Like, so this question, answer to the question exists in mm -hmm. a PDF document. So this was a GPT-4 technical report, which was released by OpenAI. And mm -hmm. this is something that came out in 27 March, 2023, mm -hmm. right? So just for context, those two terms, GPT-4, it's name of a model that powers chat GPT. And mm -hmm. GPT-3.5 was its predecessor. So, and we were trying to understand how do those two different AI models compare, right? And this screen right here is something that we will come back to later on, where mm -hmm. we would show how you can actually get a very pointed answer, right? In this mm -hmm. case, we were able to get this, we asked this natural language question, and we got this answer that GPT-4 improves on the latest uh, GPT 3.5 model by 19 percentage points. Mm -hmm. um, so which is what we were looking for. And we'll talk about how to get there. Uh, but very interestingly, like, you know, this just brings me on to the limitations of these large language models, right? Um, first thing is like, you know, it's, uh, it's trained on the same corpus. So it will really give you the similar answer, right? Mm -hmm. Like for all the different questions. So how do you differentiate yourself from the other application? Uh, secondly, it doesn't have any knowledge of your data. Uh, thirdly, knowledge is not up to date. Like there's a cutoff till which it was mm -hmm. trained. In this case, September 21st. And then it can hallucinate. Hallucination mm -hmm. is this thing that we showed you where it will make up things, sound convincing, but it is not correct. Yeah. It's very believable. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it comes up with some stuff I'm like, hmm, that sounds good. Let me double check. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, um, right. So I think one very critical piece in this era, right. And I, as I was telling you, I have a whole background in machine learning. And mm -hmm. one thing in this has always stayed true, right. Whether it is building your own application that can understand music, whether it is um, building self-driving cars, whether it mm -hmm. is building uh, platforms for enterprises, uh, across my career stages, your private data is what creates a differentiation with AI models, right? So mm -hmm. language, the data is super critical. And that piece is something that we'll talk about, right? How do you use your data? How do you build mm -hmm. uh, stuff on AI? And that's something I'm super excited about. That's where all the power is derived. Mm -hmm. um, and on that front, like, you know, how do we change that? Like, you know, how do we like, you know, build these applications really that are powered by these large language models, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where it actually knows and aware of your information about your uh, business, yeah. about your um, user base. So that's where like there is this first method that's called this kind of model fine tuning, mm -hmm. right? So it, that's where you would take like a base model, like in this case, chat GPT's model, mm -hmm. and you would give it a lot of these examples, which are from your private data stores, and you would kind of uh, retrain some of the layers of that pre-trained models. So now it will know about your context and what you will get is something called a fine-tuned model, mm -hmm. right? So now you will give it a query and you will get your output and it would know about this newer information, mm -hmm. right? So the second method uh, that's there is something called retrieval augmented generation, right? Uh, in this case, you keep your core model as it is, like ChatGPT's model, but as part of your input, right? Like, so your input in this case is your prompt prefix. You would start giving it those examples of mm -hmm. information fetched from your private data store, which really contain the relevant information, right? And mm -hmm. 
because of that, the foundation model will be able to use its past knowledge as well as this new knowledge coming as part of the prompt or input and give you the right output. Mm -hmm. So that's just one way how we were able to get this query answered with that I showed you, right? Uh, how much better is CPD4? This is the question we started off with that uh, chat mm -hmm. example. Um, and we were able to kind of stuff and build this uh, final response out. So yeah. um, this it's, is just an example of RAG. Yeah, and so in this case, it's taking that PDF, which has been um, converted into vector embeddings, and then querying that to get the correct answer from the PDF, because the, the model itself didn't know the answer. It just made it up. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. nice. And I get that question a lot as well. Like uh, the two different models you said, fine tuning versus rag. Um, and I think that a lot of people get those mixed up. So I think your explanation really kind of um, hit the nail on the head. Like you, you, the, the fine tuning is where you, you tune the actual model, but the rag um, approach is where you, you've got your embeddings and you're just using a regular model to, to then generate the correct response from your actual data. Yeah, yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Okay, I think I got it now. I'm not seeing any other Ooh. questions, so I think I think the audience has it too. Um, actually, wait, there is one question. Let's see what um, what models are. Let me just put this on the screen. So, what models are they using in GT, GPT four over three point five? What has been fine tuned? Do you know the answer to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, the models that we talked about, like, you know, we didn't talk about the fine tuned models. Mm -hmm. um, so GPT 3.5 and 4 are really these different uh, generations of model that were released by OpenAI. Um, mm -hmm. um, so they are like kind of differences in the architecture of the model. So these are like basically fundamentally these different models. And at this point, like, you know, they didn't release a lot of information about what really made GPT-4, mm -hmm. uh, how it's made, how it's different from 3.5. Sure. We just know it's trained on a lot more data, has a lot more parameters, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Cool. And then one other question, which method do you think is better, method one or two? Yeah, so I think um, between those two methods, uh, it really depends on what you're trying to do. So fine tuning is something uh, that requires a lot of labeled data sets, right? Like, so it is expensive and time consuming mm -hmm. to put together the data set and then do this kind of a training, uh, which will require resources and time, um, right? So, and then there is like, you know, you have to, there are these like newer upcoming models coming out, right? So open source ecosystem has been exploding since, for instance, mm -hmm. um, there was a recent model Mistral, which just came out, um, Meta of Llama has been coming out a lot of models. So you will all, if you're building your own fine-tuned model, you will always have to keep competing with these state-of-the-art models. Mm -hmm. um, however, where fine-tuning really helps and sometimes become very critical required is your specific domains like medical domains, legal uh, insurance, etc. Right. So in these domains, it's really beneficial to actually teach the model your own vocabulary, your own knowledge, your own context, because a lot of that information will not exist online, right? Mm -hmm. It's important to remember these models are mostly trained on internet data. So you would fine tune your model there, um, but even with that, uh, you would still want to use it in a retrieval augmented generation setup because mm -hmm. you will still, you will you would have taught your model the style of that domain, but you will need to feed it the knowledge yeah. So that way, with this tool augmentation, you will not have to continuously continue fine tuning as the new information keeps coming in. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, I see that as uh, complementary um, in yeah. some domain specific use cases. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, you, you could use them both. I mean, technically, you could use both together, depending on your use case. Yeah, exactly. Sure. OK, um, let's see. Da, 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 da. One other question, really quick. Okay, will RAG lead to recall ceiling in terms of retrieval of documents? And how could we deal with that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And maybe that's, maybe uh, that's more advanced add... for towards the end of the stream. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think uh, so. We will have the discussion as mm -hmm. part of this walkthrough. So um, yeah, cool. we could probably take it up after we have covered some more ground and we can talk about what exactly is recall and 
what are the elements around uh, figuring that out and how does it scale as you continue yeah. adding more of these chunks? All right, you got ahead of us. All right, we're going to get to that. <laughs> let's move on. So what it, what is, well, we talked about what RAG is and what, um, let's talk about the data preparation to, to get this going. Awesome, yeah. So yeah, so we'll talk about, we'll talk about RAG and essentially uh, we want to focus on RAG is consisting of like kind of two steps. One is the data preparation, right? So in this case, there is a on the left a private knowledge source, like a PDF that I showed you in that video. So mm -hmm. PDF has tens of pages. The way you would convert that data, prepare the data is you would do this thing called chunking of the document, mm -hmm. right? So that, that is really splitting that uh, large PDF into smaller segments. Mm -hmm. um, and you want to do that because of multiple reasons, but primarily like you want to use it on an embedding model, right? Mm -hmm. And embedding models have a limitation on the amount of input it can take. Yep. So, but we'll talk more about chunking later, but essentially you the chunk the document, uh, you store those chunks in a data store, you create these embeddings, which is mm -hmm. uh, just this, array of floating point numbers and you basically store that into a vector search solution mm -hmm. so a vector search um, in this case we are using mongodb vector search uh, is it's a it's a solution that allows you to very efficiently store and search and retrieve across these different embeddings right across mm -hmm. millions of embedding that's where you would be doing your k nearest neighbor search that powers a lot of these semantic search and rag use cases Awesome. So, so that this is the data preparation part, basically, that you would do. So, take all your knowledge, all your PDFs, all your documents that you want to be searching across internal documentation, and store it into a vector search solution. Sounds easy. <laughs> Sounds easy, but uh, <laughs> becomes challenging pretty quickly. Uh, but yes. yeah, it is it is super powerful to get started, and you can build a lot of amazingly powerful applications in just a couple of hours to a couple of days. It's amazing. Nice. Um, now, the second phase in the RAG pipeline is this querying. And we'll probably talk more about it. But essentially, like, you know, when you're trying to figure something out, like, you would, this is the kind of steps that you would take. Uh, like, given a user query, like in this case, how much better is GPT-4, right? Mm -hmm. You pass it into an embedding model, same embedding model that we used while mm -hmm. preparing our data. That's very critical, needed. Mm -hmm. And we would basically search for in our vector search solution. So what that will give us is the nearest neighbors or like related information to this query. In this case, um, our top matches from this vector search were these chunks, mm -hmm. right? So chunks are this piece of information or the parts of that PDF um, that has some of the information. And we would take these chunks and we would essentially uh, give it as part of a prompt, right? So a prompt to a large language model mm -hmm. would be something like, okay, hey, you are a MongoDB, uh, you're a expert, uh, given these pieces of information, answer the user query. So you would list out all these chunks that we retrieve, stuff it as part of the prompt and give the user query, mm -hmm. right? And you would basically then the large language model like uh, OpenAI, GPT-4 will give you some kind of a coherent answer, uh, which mm -hmm. is what we obtained. So mm -hmm. yeah, so that's the kind of the high level overview process of how uh, we would think of the RAG. So let's let's take a move back to the beginning um, and talk a little bit more about the chunking. Look like, let's, let's kind of dissect each of these steps maybe. Um, yeah. So I think, aren't there maybe some tools that might help with that process of chunking and then creating the embeddings yeah yeah so now talking about embeddings um uh like you know so generally like and you know, i think um the first thing is like you know how do you choose your embedding model right so broadly there are two classes one is these uh, proprietary models that are available as an API. So mm -hmm. OpenAI text embedding ADA002, that's one of the state of the art that's used a lot, is an example of a proprietary model where you would essentially call an API to a mm -hmm. model that's hosted by OpenAI and you would get back an embedding, right? Other option is these 
your own models, uh, open source that you would have hosted somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, and you would be able to um, have that same mechanism, um, call mm -hmm. the model, get the embedding back. So those are the two places. So, so like, you know, you would find a lot of these uh, models on Hugging Face, for instance, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Hugging Face is this open repository of models. So you, there is something called uh, MTEB, mm -hmm. Massive Text Embedding Benchmark, uh, which is a page on Hugging Face where you would find a list of these uh, embedding models um, and their various characteristics across variety of tasks that you're trying mm -hmm. to perform with them. So typically, like, you know, we see a lot of uh, customers start off with open AI and and in certain cases, uh, like, you know, they would start hitting limitations as they get to a certain size. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give an example, right? So uh, in our internal experiments, uh, like, you know, so we were trying to look at this medical data set. So it's kind of almost like uh, the question asking a question of um, what is, uh, like, you know, is my heart condition covered under my insurance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, the model that we were using, uh, it was a birth family based model. It was basically returning information about heart medicines, which mm -hmm. are generic in nature. Mm -hmm. So it was a very weird thing, right? Like, you know, we're just not getting the right answer. Uh, so those kinds of things will happen, right? With the choice of an embedding model. So mm -hmm. another example was um, like, you know, just looking for, hey, is my what should I be doing in case of a heart attack? Mm. Um, and this was basically sending out back the response about what are what are the things that are covered in case a patient gets heart attack mm -hmm. under an insurance policy. Okay. The reason for this was like you know in that data set, like let's say it's a it's a PDF document, so there was a chunk, there was a section for both of these medicines mm -hmm. versus the coverage for heart attack. And the embedding model that was representing this was basically trained in a way where it thought there was a lot of high amount of correlation between these two things, mm, okay. right? So, so it's for such certain things like you know maybe OpenAI's off-the-shelf model or like you know there are other state-of-the-art models from open-source world which may not work and would require some fine-tuning that we are seeing. So, okay. so that's the kind of the segment of how you would think of your embedding and then like you know we're obviously talking about uh accuracy so that with there like you know there is the context limitation context window number of tokens so right you are always looking mm -hmm. at how many so open ai for instance open ai idea 2 has a context window of 81 91 tokens mm -hmm. tokens are like kind of words that you can use um but like something like a uh, there are other like you know Microsoft came out with the E5 model, which is pretty good. There is a um, bunch of uh, other models. Uh, instructor family is pretty great class of models, so that would have typically like a output embedding dimension of 768, mm -hmm. and which is number of elements in the array. But input sequence or the context window limitation of 512, for instance. Yeah. So you have to look at like how much so this affects the chunking strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we have talked about uh, accuracy, the cost it will cost you, the privacy considerations, right? Sending data mm -hmm. to someone else versus hosting your own model. Mm -hmm. um, so other consideration that you would want to have with this embedding model is essentially like the language that you would be using or the mm -hmm. kind of data you would be using. Um, so we're talking about English language text in this case, but mm -hmm. what if you wanted to use German, Chinese, mm -hmm. In the right, like so, different models are trained have ability to translate between different languages. So OpenAI, for instance, is pretty performant. Um, their model, we don't have a definite list, but supposed to be all the major languages, up to ninety mm -hmm. languages. But uh, like you know, E five has a multilingual model, which was really trained on I think uh, Robert XLM model. So that supports up to hundred languages. So you would want to think of like, you know, what kind of language, what, where your users are, what you're trying to solve for um, mm -hmm. in terms of choosing that model. Um, and the other piece of embedding piece is really about like what type of data you're using. So we talked about text, but you can also use the same thing for images, mm -hmm. right? So uh, you can use the same thing for open uh, like audio files. So for images, there is something called a clip model, right? Like, you know, which essentially mm. embeds your 
image data and your text data in the same embedding space, right? So that embedding space is that like visualization that graph that we saw. So essentially you can ask a text question and it can point you to an image or you can give it an image, it can tell mm -hmm. you what text it represents. So essentially you can search your images using mm -hmm. text or using other image, you can search, find other similar images. So it depends on what kind of data you're trying to use. So all these factors yeah. will go into selection of embedding. It sounds like that first step of picking the embedding model is is pretty critical. And it could, I don't know, it seems overwhelming to me right now because there's so many different, but I, I would say that depending on your use case, um, I would say that like the more popular ones are more general purpose and will work for most people, I would say, right? Unless you have a really specific use case, that's when you really have to maybe go down the line and find the correct model for your use case, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think the key always is uh, start simple mm -hmm. and you will get a lot far. Don't yeah. complicate things in the beginning. Yeah. Just pick one. So <laughs> yeah, just, you know, that's where we are seeing a lot of adoption with uh, instructor models in open source worlds and mm -hmm. opening idea to you start off with that. Yeah. Uh, once you hit bottlenecks, that's when you optimize, but you good go. to keep all these considerations in mind. Awesome. Awesome. It's good to know. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I honestly, I didn't know that there were that many considerations um, for just picking your embedding model because <laughs> I always just go with the, you know, the standard and um, so that, that's good to know. And so then after that, after the embedding model, the back to the chunking, because obviously it depends on the embedding model, how many um, uh, tokens you can use. Um, my, I guess my question was, are there tools to help you chunk that data? Like, you, you know how many yeah, tokens yeah. you have, but like, how do you actually yeah. the process of actually chunking it? Yeah. So I think, uh, that is one of the most common questions we get mm -hmm. and like, you know, so chunking for context, like, you know, you can, if you're looking to chunk a PDF, you can chunk mm -hmm. it by page by page, paragraph mm -hmm. by paragraph, sentence by sentence. Um, or like use some kind of a fixed window, which just has enough number of tokens that you can put into that particular model. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, like, and there's no right answer. So mm -hmm. one uh, rule of thumb is each chunk should be uh, it should contain single topic, so mm -hmm. that it should not like jump between different topics. So uh, so that there is a good semantic representation. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, there there is some experimentation involved. Uh, right in this case, if if you're building advanced application as you try to improve, continue improving accuracy. Yeah. But in general, uh, so Langchain, Lama Index have some of the box uh, chunking mechanisms which work mm -hmm. pretty well. But if nothing else, just a rolling window kind of a thing mm -hmm. is something that should just work. Cool. Um, so the next step in the process was uh, just trying to go back to the slides here. Um, so then you've created your, you've, you've chunked, you've created your embeddings from your model and then vector search. Um, you want to elaborate more on that, that search functionality? Yeah. Yeah. So now essentially we are talking about like, you know, we have stored that information in a vector database, in a vector mm -hmm. search, and we are doing a retrieval, right? So mm -hmm. what are the considerations there? Like, how do you want to think of it? And this kind of plays into the question that came in the beginning about mm -hmm. recall and hitting the mm -hmm. performance benchmarks, right? So when you're doing that search, uh, one of the most critical pieces you are doing is specifying your K. K is the number of neighbors that we're looking for that are similar to that provided input query, mm -hmm. right? So, so one thing right off the bat is that, like, you know, we see a lot of examples online where K is like five or, three or four, like, you know, so typically, like, you know, you want to have like a larger value of K. So mm -hmm. uh, we did some like, you know, benchmarking. So in general, like, you know, with less than five K chunks, retrieving chunks on data sets, you get like a 70% recall accuracy. Mm -hmm. So what that means is recall is a term for how many actual results that we get that were actually answers to that given query. Mm -hmm. That's recall. Um, and 70% is basically like we only got 70% of the right answers. So mm -hmm. like, that number is just bad, right? Mm -hmm. Regardless of what embedding model you used or what chunking strategy you used, mm -hmm. just because you choose that small K, uh, once you improve, increase that K to something like um, 100, mm -hmm. you 
get down to like something like a 97% recall accuracy mm -hmm. right off the bat same chunking same embedding and going further down to like 200k mm -hmm. uh, is something you would get to about 99% recall accuracy mm -hmm. this is obviously on a particular data set and like you know this won't generalize but um, yeah. there are some trends there right so beyond mm -hmm. k200 we found there were these minor improvements in the accuracy in the recall accuracy improvement and uh, with that, you're looking at a trade-off of increased query time. Mm -hmm. So that's where like you know, one recommendation is always starting with like something between 100 to 100 for K and uh, going from there. Um, so that was one piece. So I think that's yeah. where the question was about like, you know, as we continue growing, improving the data set, let's say we start off with like hundreds of vectors, mm -hmm. move into like thousands of vectors and move into hundreds of thousands of vectors. And then we move into millions of vectors like we, as we continue adding data. So how will that work? Like what are the challenges there? Mm -hmm. So one piece kind of becomes critical with that, like, you know, as you continue growing your data is mm -hmm. something using something for, uh, for filters, right? So filters are your, metadata based filters like so mm -hmm. you would have a text field which sits alongside your original document right so in this is something you would be doing like a operation as a standard operation like a less than greater than equal to mm -hmm. um so just for an example right like you know if you were building an internal chatbot uh which for a company and uh we would basically get all the information there like all the hr policies all the uh salary information so like so you can in HR, like an employees can ask a question right. like, hey, what is the vacation policy? Right. right. But now that we have all the data, like, you know, you could also ask a question like, okay, like how much vacations that person X took, right? Mm. And like, you know, that becomes a problem because it kind of leads to mm. uh, right uh, privacy invasion uh, yeah. where it's convenient to be able to answer that question and not use someone's time but like this becomes a problem so that's where like you know for such kind of use cases with larger data sets you don't think of filtering in this case uh like you know with mongodb vector search like you know, it's possible to do this filtering and you would basically filter that okay as you're asking this question you will only be able to retrieve chunks of text which are allowed for your policy mm -hmm. right so those kinds of things become important um in terms of continuing to do it in a compliant and a safe way so so one thing with like MongoDB pre-filtering approach is that we really do like a pre-filter, mm -hmm. right? So what that means is there are two approaches to this filtering, right? As pre-filtering, post-filtering. So with MongoDB, uh, the filter is applied when you're doing this approximate KNN search. So that if you're requested for K documents, you will always get those K documents. And mm -hmm. in some sense, like, um, it's not going to be reduced. So like in some other vector databases, uh, what we see is uh, it's a post filter. So it what it'll do is just do that vector search for K. Mm -hmm. Let's say you were looking for 50 documents and then apply the filter that mm -hmm. so this reduced. So you would end up getting like less number of documents, right? Which is inaccurate and doesn't really serve the purpose. So and like, you know, you wouldn't want to think of filters across different constructs. So like, you know, one of our customers who moved here was using this filter on geolocation information mm -hmm. so like if you're searching for properties like okay give me all the houses with a swimming pool but mm -hmm. now you still which is vector searches are great at but like mm -hmm. it's not super great at accuracy around the distances mm -hmm. so if you're looking in san francisco let's say you only want something within five miles of san francisco that piece of information is super critical for a real estate search but it won't work with the semantic use case. So that's where mm -hmm. you would use a filter. MongoDB has a geospatial location filter in this case. So you know the user where they are, where they're searching for. So you can kind of uh, restrict your data set, your search, and in conjunction, achieve a lot of powerful experiences. So I think that was one of the questions around yeah. recall benchmarking. That's how you improve it. Yeah, I think I think that's one of the the key differentiators. Um, we have there's there's tons of vector databases, uh, but most of them are are meant as like standalones. And whereas in MongoDB, you can do everything: keep keep your application data, your vector embeddings, and the, the filtering abilities. All of that in MongoDB, uh, you don't have to set up any back and forth uh, tra transactions between 
you know, your your application database and your vector store database and making sure everything's in sync. You just keep it all in one place. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's been our, one of our big approaches, right? Like, you know, it's a developer data platform. So mm -hmm. as your, your platform is ready, has all the things streaming, uh, data to batch data to all these fancy filters and time mm -hmm. series information and you can use it as a manual ready so but your yeah. foundations are in the right place and that's where we are finding that's a, that's our approach to vector search as well you can really bring together all these powerful capabilities together yeah. in that unified whole and then back to your to your uh, hr chatbot uh, illustration so in that case the chatbot would have still gotten the documents that you know, this user may not um, have access to see, but the filter happens um, and then the user, if they asked for some other person's vacation history, they wouldn't actually see that data because again, MongoDB would have filtered that out, right? Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. what you're achieving is really something of a role-based access control. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and like this is happening within the vector search solution. Like this is not something you have to build awkward filters in your application layer. Mm -hmm. The data will not leave that secure enclave of right. your data center. So yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, so do you want to move on to um to the step five? Uh, yeah. Prompt. Um so I think we'll talk about the prompt and like you know maybe like you know so the final step is you retrieved all this from your vector store and mm -hmm. you would basically pass with the original question. You will give it some instructions. Um, so as part of the system level instruction to the prompt, you want to talk about, you, you can do stuff like you can give it a voice, assume mm -hmm. you are a MongoDB expert, assume mm -hmm. you are an HR expert. Mm -hmm. And so that will change the tonality, right? Of how, what, how it will respond to it. Then you basically provided instruction, just restrict your answer according to this information provided. Mm -hmm. So that's a way of generating like grounded. Mm -hmm. Uh, response that's in your data that you know is true and you can provide explicit in instructions to okay do not respond if you do not find the information in the provided information chunks yeah so that's a way of instructing like reducing the chances of it hallucinating so yeah. once you let it know explicitly in your prompt that it's okay to respond with i do not know the answer mm -hmm. right you would find it doesn't make up a lot of things. Nice. So, so that's again goes back into how do you reduce that hallucination, build more uh, mm -hmm. solid, solid and explainable um, retrieval mechanisms. So, that's the part of the like the prompt that you generate, and that kind of feeds very closely with how do you think of the generation LM, right? So, finally, you would provide this prompt into any model. So, something like a Llama 2 will work great for this, or Google Spam or OpenAI, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. So this step of selection of your model, large language model doesn't have to be similar to the one that you use the embeddings mm -hmm. for in the initial yeah. state. So those are like separate stuff. Yeah. Um, and one piece, like you know, again, like you know, this large language model will also have a input context window. So now you could retrieve any number of chunks, but you have to be mindful that it has to fit in. Mm -hmm. to the context window of this new model that you're using mm -hmm. right so of your retrieve chunk you may have to like you know you retrieve 100 you may have to re-rank it uh, so there's a re-ranker stage which are like you know using uh, another light model like cross encoders so you just give me the top um, mm -hmm. results that may matter or like you know you would use something like a uh, technical like RRF, which can combine your text keyword based BM25 with your vector search based solutions. So mm -hmm. you would want to think of how do you fit all the retrieve information, uh, give it the topmost chunk such that it fits into this prompt window. Mm -hmm. um, so recently, like, you know, what we have been seeing is that that context window has been increasing. So there's a company called Anthropic, uh, they mm -hmm. have a model called Claude. Mm -hmm. very it's kind of a competitor to open ai yep. um gpd model so they came out with something which had a context window of 100k tokens which really means you can provide like these 100k tokens as part of the input mm -hmm. um so gpd4 has also some private models where the context window can go up to 16k 32k what they have publicly available is 8k context mm -hmm. window uh, 
so there is an interesting research which came out of it, right? So it's just because you have a larger context window, you cannot just continue using it. Like one is mm -hmm. obviously higher latency and higher cost because you are mm -hmm. being charged by the tokens. But also it can lead to an impairment in your accuracy, right? So this research is paper is called something like on the lines of lost in the middle. Mm. Um, and it's from the researchers at Stanford and UC Berkeley. And what they really found is that models are better at using relevant information that occurs at the very beginning or the mm. very end of the input context. Mm. So that's where the lost in middle is, right? So mm -hmm. it's basically like, you know, just another way of putting it is um, you're able, you're basically just, it's just not considering information that exists in the middle, right? Like, so whatever facts and what information was there, it kind of, um, it just like, you know, it just degraded. It's just not there. Mm -hmm. So that's strange. Even though I get, you, I, I yeah. get that a lot with chat GPT, I'm asking it questions and I'm, I've told it something and it's, you know, down the line, it's not doing what I told it. And I have to remind it, Hey, I, I, don't forget. I told you to do this. Why is it forgetting? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, so just, um, so like, you know, the performance is, um, like, you know, it can actually degrade if, and if you're stuffing mm -hmm. it with more information. So this is just something mm -hmm. to keep in mind when you're building your rag applications. And if you're getting that kind of a hit, you want to experiment with mm -hmm. choosing a different mechanism in the pipeline. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Nice. So we got all, all the embeddings, all that work, but you still have to, you know, make sure that your prompt is, is a good prompt. So prompt engineering is a thing, like having a good prompt to make sure that it's using that data in the most efficient way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, prompt is a thing. And then yeah, you want to experiment with a bunch of that. And then you have mm -hmm. to think of how, what large language model are you using? What, Mm -hmm. window limitation sizes are and yeah mm -hmm. do some of this smarter stuff with the retrieve chunks so mm -hmm. that you can get the best responses i think that i think we covered like that step six already didn't we like generation and llms um do you want to explain yeah. maybe on some some of the frameworks yeah so um in general like you know uh, the example uh, so actually let me so there are a bunch of these frameworks so right so that you could be using to mm -hmm. accelerate your journey mm -hmm. and we have integrations in all of these frameworks but so langchain llama index are two really popular ones right mm -hmm. and we have integrations and some tutorials there you should check it out mm -hmm. um something from microsoft is coming out called microsoft semantic kernel uh, that allows you to uh, build these kind of use your data with vector stores with mm -hmm. like large language models um, but just taking a step back, like why do you need these um, frameworks or where in what cases would it be useful, right? Mm -hmm. So essentially, as we talked about, like in a rag based architecture, there is each step has some loss of information, right? So chunking, embedding stage may miss details due to chunk size and embedding model limitations. So the retrieval stage, uh, you want to experiment with different key parameter mm -hmm. that you provided and the similarity function that you're using. Finally, in the response generation phase, um, you're, you're looking at your different LLM models, the context length, et cetera. So with all these variables, you have to like, you know, if you're trying to debug an experiment, like you, know, you mm -hmm. want to experiment. So that's where like some of these like model agnostic dev frameworks like Langchain, Llama Index, are a good way because they allow mm -hmm. you to retain your core constructs uh, while being able to plug in play play around with these different ways mm -hmm. of doing things um right so so yeah and like you know you can you get some access to various chains and stuff that are coming out so you can it's easy to like experiment um before you mm -hmm. understand okay like, this is something that really works for me and i can mm -hmm. create some uh, like something very efficient with that so nice. um i i have i had a bunch of uh demos in like langchain and llama index but i don't know if you have time for it we have so, um yeah we have um a couple minutes we can go over a little bit if you want to show us maybe just one quick demo okay so yeah maybe like you know so let's actually go through this thing for langchain um and so 
and let me tie it back to that original question that we yeah. started off with and how that will work so sure sure okay so hopefully my screen is visible now yes okay I, so I see the, the, the dogs and cats at the top uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah so so this is a, a kind of a walkthrough for using langchain with mongodb to build q a, &A uh, rack based architecture so first step is setting up the environment right like you would set up your mongodb variables etc uh, you enter into that data preparation phase that we talked about so in this we are basically using a blank chain document loader to get the pdf in this mm -hmm. case that gp4 paper two lines of code um, you got a document then you want to do this chunking Mm -hmm. So in this case, we are using a method in Langchain called recursive character text splitter. Mm -hmm. uh, so what it does is essentially like you know allows you to set up what chunk size you want. In this case, it's like 500 tokens. Like you can define a certain chunk overlap. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, it's zero. Typically, I recommend having a certain overlap that improves mm -hmm. your accuracy between different chunks. Um, once you define that chunking strategy, you would uh, basically just do it over the retrieved data mm -hmm. in this case docs is how where you will get like an array of these like chunked information mm -hmm. um and then like you know once the, this is done with the uh the the chunking stage and the last stage is essentially like embedding it and storing it into a vector database so that is happening in this step right so mm -hmm. we have a langchain native construct for mongo db atlas vector search we are initializing it with these documents that we retrieved. We are specifying a uh, embedding function. In this case, we are using OpenAI embeddings. Mm -hmm. And we are basically telling it which collection in MongoDB should it go into and mm -hmm. what would that index name, or Atlas Vector Search Index name be. So with this construct, uh, like you know, it will take that all the documents that all the chunks that we prepared and create embeddings for it and store it into Atlas Vector Search. Nice. So, so all that essentially that all that complex yeah, stuff yeah, we talked exactly. about at the beginning chunk and all that lang chain really helps with that yeah exactly so you have like 10 lines of code and like you know that's whole process nice. is done so then we talk about the query process so you would do this once on on mm -hmm. all your data and then ongoing basis you would be doing your data query mm -hmm. so in this space we are initializing that connection to our vector search right so now all that information is sitting in your database and anytime you have a downstream application you initialize it so you provide the connection string mongodb uri database name what mm -hmm. embeddings you want to use mm -hmm. and then essentially using this vector search construct you can um, start feeding in the question so now the question going back to that one is how much better is gp4 in reducing hallucinations over gp3.5 mm -hmm. Provide that question. We initialize like a large language model. In this case, we're using OpenAI's chart model, mm -hmm. providing it the version GPT 3.5 Turbo. You can plug and play different models here. Mm -hmm. um, and this is essentially your prompt, right? It's in, and then we essentially use this QA chain, which is a retrieval QA, is one of the chains that Langchain provides. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, it's beneficial use for like this q a kind of a setup so mm -hmm. as part of the retrieval q a chain we provided the llm like what language model we want and we provided the vector source like the vector search solution in this case provided the retriever ar argument so this is in put into so now it knows like okay this is where you sub submit your get your chunks from and this is the large language model you use for generating the final output nice uh, then we call this with the query that we provided and basically you get this result so in this case the result is gpt4 scores 19 percentage points higher than gpt 3.5 and reducing hallucinations so um, again like you know less than 10 lines of code and you have a pretty high performing pretty decent uh search already and then with like you know mongodb has a bunch of customizations with these lang chains where you can use pre-filters post filters mm -hmm. really tap into that power of mql Mm -hmm. to build uh, like you know combine it together with these large language models to build really powerful experiences yeah and and, and the uh, mql so the aggregation pipeline stages there there's a vector search stage so you can combine that do stuff before and after correct like there's so much so many possibilities with this 
Yeah, yeah. Um, we recently announced dollar vector search stage um, and last week, and we already have uh, integration updated in, on Langchain, which mm -hmm. uses that uh, dollar vector search stage. Nice. So yeah, uh, we are very invested in these frameworks. Uh, we are uh, gonna be like you know continue improving and iterating on those. But yeah, uh, post filter uh, like you know uh, with this new dollar vector search stage, mm -hmm. you can really tap into those rich semantics of different operators like equal, less than, etc. Mm -hmm. to be able to combine with your filters that we talked about in the beginning. Nice. Yeah. So if you were um, if you stuck with us through the entire stream, the beginning part was the hard part where, where we talked about how all this stuff works in the background. And then uh, the last two, two minutes has been the 10 line code demo of how easy it actually is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think uh, depends on where you are in the journey, but yes. it's always important to remember uh, it's easy to get started. Like, you know, that's yes. the power of this. And uh, if that's something you take away, if you're beginning on this journey, that's that should be your one takeaway. Nice, nice. Awesome. Well. Um, is there anything before we wrap up? Because we are over time. But uh, before we wrap up, anything else that you want to add? Or cool. Uh, no, I think uh, it was. I had a really good time, and thank you so much for having me over. And hopefully, the audience found this useful. Uh, some of the practices that we see in the field, that we see in practice, that can really help you improve your rag architectures. Yes. And we would love to hear your use cases, what you're doing. Definitely. Um, uh, and thank you again for joining us. I think this was very useful. Again, the recording is going to be available as soon as we, we finish up here. So you'll be able to go back and rewatch if you want to. Um, there are links to a, a great article that Prakul wrote and our vector search documentation linked in the video description on YouTube. Um, I think we're also going to post those links in, uh, in LinkedIn as well if you're watching there. Uh, so be sure to check those out. Uh, again, come back next week where we're going to have Henry Weller talk to us about HNSW. If you don't know what that is, you'll find out next week. Uh, so be sure to come back to, to learn about that. And if this video was helpful, give it a like and subscribe for more MongoDB content. Any last words, Prakul? No, uh, I had a great day. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. We'll see you all next time.